that's a typical thing that a lot of people will do. Oh, I see a conolasma sponge. That's that sort of leafy looking sponge. Mm -hmm. We have a question about the seamount being unnamed. Will it be named anytime soon? Anyone? Yeah, so um, there's a process that that you can go through to officially name a, a seamount. In the case of these expeditions, we'd be working with uh, the Papahana Mokuikea um, monument uh, kind of cultural group to develop names for these seamounts if, if we want to name them. Uh, it can be really useful when, you know, we're writing papers and, and want to refer to the seamount in a, in a specific way. So, you know, someone can search through the literature for unnamed seamount and come up with, you know, 50 different seamounts. So it's sometimes it's really useful to have a name, but uh, it is a, a fairly long process to get a name assigned. So Adam, it looks like there's about um, probably a kilometer left um, between waypoints 9 and 11. Mm -hmm. And then there's a couple of waypoints that we have a bit downslope, um, 12 and 13. Um, just to let you know the progress. Yeah, so I wonder if we want to shift. I mean, we do kind of want to go up the ridge, but I, uh, if we want to stay at this elevation, do I go up n north and then maybe swing to waypoint 11? Go north, so kind of uh, rather than go from here straight to 10, go like... Well, see, the path we have for uh, to get to 10 is a good one, right? It's along yeah. that ridge line, so right. I think we want to do that. Yep. Then I think that we'll ask the question of do we want to go north, then south? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it would be some amount of backtracking, but if it's really uh, exciting up there, it's still yeah. probably worth it. Um, or do we want to just go south? And yeah. I think that that's a pretty steep slope to go downhill on. So seems like it could be. That. Yeah, if if we did it, it would make most sense to to midwater down to the base and come back up that side. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but timing wise, it seems like we're doing all right. We'll go past the twenty four hours by the time we're on deck, but. Potentially, how I mean, they could co they could cover a fair bit in the next watch, regardless of what we do. Yeah, I think we'll Not take that. a look at what time it is when we get to waypoint ten and kind of make an assessment. Then. Okay, sounds good. Are right, we're gonna hand over up here? We are getting ready for a shift change. So we want to thank our viewers for tuning in, following our exploration. Keep sending your questions in. Hey, we're still on the move, so just want to monitor here. Gonna have to come up, I think. Why don't you come up, and we'll have just come up too. All right.
Josh, did they say anything about the uh, about the starboard rail slash bucket cam? I didn't hear anything about that. No. It just went out. Okay, it's just powered off is all, so it may just be a question of being powered off. Oh, I see. Well, I could always turn one on and see what happens. I just got to get it. Get up here. Adios, Rennie. See you, Rennie. Um, yeah, we're moving westerly towards waypoint 10. Uh, there's a little bit of difference between the ship and where we are. That started when they got onto the ridge moving west. Um, okay. So I'm going to keep the moves that Rainy has going, which is at bearing 250, which hopefully that will keep you guys from departing farther to the north. Sounds um, good. Um, yeah. And I'll adjust as needed. Uh, Steve, you'll let us know what's the plan after we make it up to waypoint 10, correct? Yeah, yeah. Sounds good, just keep it on. All right. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put a move in. Yep, sounds great. Just to keep the momentum. I'll try Bridge, one of those cameras, yeah. Gabby, and see. Yeah, uh, sure, go for it. Can we move 100 meters bearing 250? Oh, Correct, 100 meters, bearing 250. There's a lot of good stuff here. Yeah, a little bit different than this morning, right? Mm hmm totally. Yeah. Also, hi, everyone. We're back. Hey. <laughs> we just did a watch change for all of our listeners. Uh, so this is your... 12 to 4 watch. We were here in the middle of the night, and now we just uh, came back from lunch. So excited to be back online, and it looks like we've been seeing lots of biological life. So exciting time to come back to watch. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it was just a turn it off or something. Everything's fine. No okay. Fault. Yeah, looks must good. have just got bumped. Yeah, looks good to me. Be good with starboard rail. Uh, better than yep, bucket. that's better than bucket, I would assume. Yeah, yeah. bucket <laughs> is not helpful. <laughs> <laughs> it's steep here. It's still taking some time to get out in front. Yeah. Sorry, what was that last bearing, uh, Kate? Uh, uh, 250. 250, roger. Oh, look, the current, you can see it in that crinoid. Yeah. Vibrating like that. All the branch tips on all these corals are moving, suggesting there's a pretty appreciable current here. So now that we're a little settled in, maybe you can do some quick intros. We missed some of our people in our last 12 to 4 watch because we started off strong with a rock sample. Um, so I'm going to kind of go through our watch today so you know who is in the control van. My name is Kelly. I'm in the science communication seat. And maybe we can do introdu introductions in the back row first. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Steve, who is our watch lead for this watch. Hello, everyone. Steve Voskovich. I'm the watch lead for 12 to 4. Um, Sitting in the back row, we have cameras on. Give a wave. Oh yeah! Forget we got the wave action there. <laughs> yep. Uh, to my right, I have. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Ashley Mickens. I am the data logger and ocean science intern. Um, yeah, I'm a master's student at the University of Victoria. So hello. <laughs> and then we'll, do we want to do the front row and start with video, Steve? Sure. This is Steve. Uh, the other Steve. In the video chair. Glad to be here. Uh, 
I want to go next. Yep, go ahead in the sure. Argus seat. <laughs> uh, I'm Josh Turnov. I'm uh, wear a few different hats around OET. Today I'm the Argus pilot. Uh, I'm the ROV operations manager for OET and also live on Vancouver Island. I'm actually going to dub this the Vancouver Island Watch. I think so. Three <laughs> yeah. of us in the room. Yeah, today. totally. That's got to be a first for OET. Bold assumption. Right there. Yeah. I, uh, I love that as an, I'm a Seattleite, so I'm like close. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh, totally. Go, yeah. I'm your neighbor and I, I would like to be a BC person. <laughs> <laughs> you should come join us. Yeah, it's an <laughs> excellent aspiration. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so yeah, happy to be sitting in the Argus seat and back in the control room because I actually don't get a chance to do it that often anymore, so great. I'm Gabby, I'm in the Herc seat, also from Vancouver Island. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Almost pr practically neighbors, really. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Got yeah. some ripples Ten here. minutes away. Yeah. Um, my name is Kate. I'm sitting in the navigator seat, and I live in Bellingham, Washington, so I look at Vancouver Island. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, hey, look, uh, so dead coral that like looks like it got too big for its britches and fell over. That is absolutely massive. Yeah, that large bamboo coral down there. Yeah. Very cool. I'm trying to get some coins in the zoom bank here. It's <laughs> it's been steep. Very <laughs> steep. Yeah. I'll have to get ahead. Well, we we did a bit of sampling in the half hour leading up to this dive. Uh, uh, more than that, about an hour and a half. So we we have some samples in the bank. We can okay scoot along and try and get ahead a little bit. Did we do any biological sampling, or we're mostly picking up rocks still? Yeah, we we collected our so we're pairing rocks and water. I think we got at least six rocks, right? Uh, oh no, sorry, five rocks. Yep, five rocks plus uh, Niskan samples associated with them for metal chemistry. Uh, in addition, we have sampled uh, a few different types of corals. Uh, both corals that live on sponges, as well as corals that are free-living. Uh, a couple of gastropods, which was sampled last night uh, for our watch, as well as uh, we slurped some sponge. Yep. We've got some Brussels sprout sponges here. Oh, I love those. Yeah, they're super cool. <laughs> So Gabby and Josh, I was just talking with Dave about the um, mini Zeus on Argus. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we're we're going to keep it like this and kind of try to expose for the light levels right around the vehicle. But if you ever want more of a reference, you know, I can open up the iris and try to see a little further into the distance if we're in some okay. tricky terrain or anything like that. Yeah, no. This, this Sounds great. It looks good. Cool. Pretty good to me. I might try and, uh, depending on the steepness, I might try and get in and see if I can get a decent Roger shot that. as well. Yeah. Those uh, Brussels sprout sponges are in the family Euplectelidae. Or no, sorry, uh, are they? Uh, I couldn't tell you. Let me <laughs> double check. <laughs> Come on, you're supposed to know these. <laughs> How many cruises in are you this year? Uh, this is only, <laughs> I don't know. We'll give you a pass. OK, thanks. Not all my cruises are sponge cruises, is the thing. Oh. There's, there's yeah, there's people who do non-sponge cruises. What? I know. Non-sponge cruises. I know. What is that? <laughs> Korea Day. Sorry. I don't know. I spaced out there. Different family, but also glass sponge. They were calling them the turbocharger sponge, I think, but I think it looks like a Brussels sprout stock. Valid. And it, to me, a turbocharger looks more like a snail. I would agree. Yeah. yeah. And less like a stock of Brussels sprouts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, almost like a turban snail. Yeah. Like black turban snail almost. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally. I'm pretty committed to Brussels sprout sponge. I'm with you, Gabby. I Thanks. like it. Thanks. <laughs> I'm always going to side on common names that are like vegetables or food related. Yeah. Oh, that's good. I like that. Okay, science, the zoom bank has some coins in it. All right. Pick your poisons. Uh, let's see. Keep going a little bit. Oh, maybe.
Maybe this one. Oh, hi. Not bright. bright yellows, yeah. corally thing. Yeah. What are you? Another kind of bamboo coral. Oh, really? Yep. That's big. Oh, and some other big. Oh, Ooh, wow, look at that. Whoa, oh, what's happening goodness. here? Oh, my goodness. Oh, squat lobster. And oh, pink squat lobster. I have a history with sampling these types of black corals. <laughs> they are challenging. You did a great job. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, zoom video. It's a disaster. All that matters is you got it in the bucket, right? Yeah, that is exactly what matters. Um, so, yeah, we have a black coral here of Bathypathies. We did sample this on the last cruise as well as the squat lobster associate. Um, it's a very neat collection uh, because the squat lobster is most likely a new species that's currently being Go described. Go for zoom video. And uh, the and yellow coral here. The dynamic thing you were talking about. Yeah, a little fairway. Super neat uh, esclade bamboo coral. Doesn't have a proper Latin binomial yet that we're uh, familiar with. So genus and species. So we use clades to determine uh, or to group corals and animals, organisms that belong uh, or that most similar uh, similarly resemble each other rather than other related, for example, bamboo corals in this case. Is the biggest indicator that this is a different type of bamboo coral just color, or is there something else that differentiates it? You know, um, the S clade usually has some sort of yellow wash somewhere on the colony. Mm. Um, okay. It's not really clear. And not all of them, I'll say. Okay, go on. Yeah, thank you. Not know. all of them, um, but typically it's right around the base. The but what was so interesting cool. is uh, on our last dive of the last cruise, we did see some spectacular gardens of these on the tops of uh, the seamount we finished out at. Kind of right about the same depth we're at right now. So it shows that there's some um, shared characteristics between coral communities that that bit. seamount and this. The current's kind of managing the tether pretty nicely right now, too. So we might have some more, some lower deltas in the bank. Yeah, I'm a little low right now, but it's kind of a cool shot. We've also got a number of amazing sponges and corals here in the background. We've still got Go for zoom video. a lot of uh, Aconella bamboo corals, as well as j clay bamboo corals. This, uh... You can push in a little further. Euplectelid here, possibly in the genus uh, Regadrella. Neat specimen. Very strange coloration pattern to that bamboo coral, which is behind it too. It's got kind of a red tips. Uh, if we focus on the, yeah, just to the left, you see how it's red oh, on the yeah. branch? Oh, yeah. See what you're looking at. what that is. Got a little more zoom. Yeah, go for it. Full zoom. Okay. Go wide. I'm creeping back a little bit. I'll get reoriented here. That was weird. Not sure. Couldn't quite make it out. Starting to get a little over toppy, and I'm going to come up a bit. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, go for zoom. Oh, yeah. It's Sorry, got a little close. Uh, I see what it is now. Oh, you do? Okay. So, yeah, that that's the last of the bamboo coral. The rest of it is actually covered by zoanthids. Uh, oh, it's it's like dying. Yeah, it's, oh, it's no. almost completely covered. Yeah. So that's the last bit of pinkish red bamboo coral on that colony. The sole survivors.
We have some viewers wondering how long we're going to be diving on this dive. And this is going to be about a 24-hour dive um, if we stick to that plan. I think we've been diving about 18 hours now. Um, and that's from kind of ship down to the depth we're at now. And we're at just about 2,000 meters depth. Um, so we started out at 3,900 meters depth, and we've just been moving up um, this unnamed seamount, seamount C. Um, and we'll probably max out at about 1,800 meters depth. That's where the summit of that sea, of this seamount is. Um, so we're slowly moving up a transect, um, doing both geologic and biological sampling today. For the carryovers from our last expedition, Andrea's on shore right now, and she says hi. Tectonic turtles. <laughs> hey, Andrea. Hey, Andrea. <laughs> Hello. We think of you every time we see an angular uh, unaltered rock. Every single time. No. Um, pilots, I'm going to move you at Bearing 270 for your next move. That will keep us on top of the ridge and heading towards waypoint 10. Any qualms <laughs> there? No qualms. Okay. Fantastic. Qualmless. That's great, because I was going to call it anyways. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if Andrea's on the beach right now or something. <laughs> <laughs> Drinking fruity drinks. Tectonic Turtles is a pretty good team name. We I had like a pretty Vancouver. good team. Yeah. I like Vancouver Island, though. I feel like we need a little more alliteration with it, yeah, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Alliteration. We've, we've got some time <laughs> to work on that. I love following these bamboo corals and just, like, not knowing when they're going to end. They're awesome. Andrea says she's still looking for those angular rocks, so okay, good job. Zoom, Steve? Let yeah. Let me see if I, I can, can get this. Zoom on the base of this bamboo. Okay, awesome. See, uh, I, I don't think it's the sparse brancher we're looking for, but... Um, Bridge, well. Naf. Is that something that you want to get a... Uh... Uh, it's kind of opportunistic. Oh. The... the little brittle star? Can we move 100 meters bearing to Yeah, it's kind of an opportunistic uh, sampling event. Um, or not sampling event, but rather imagery event. Thank you. For okay. the most part. Um, yeah, but we got a good image there. It's definitely branching right above the node. It looks to be like a, a three-way branch right okay, above cool. the Thanks, fourth Steve. node on the colony. Yeah. So it could be a very old um, sparse brancher or uh, just something else entirely. These bright yellows are amazing. They are. They're so vibrant. It's like highlighter yellow almost. Yeah. What is the yellow part? Is that the skeleton that we're looking at? That's that's the um, largely the senenchyme. So it's the tissue between the polyps themselves. Okay. And there was some debate about whether these could be S1 clades or possibly another... Uh, Another genus, um, Echnomyces. Uh, you know that they're typically we see uh, yellow wash like on the base of these, uh, on the you know between the bottom okay, of the base on. and the, you know first few branches. But this one is a really unusual, um, I guess in 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 total. But uh, in, now that we've seen a number of them between the last cruise and this, uh, they're starting to be. Pretty characteristic for this site, these kinds of sites, and these depths. Nice proisocrinus, a giant red crinoid. We're seeing several different coral species here. A lot of the unbranched ones are actually uh, primnoids, uh, so that bamboo corals, uh, rather, uh, primnoid octocorals that have those scaly textures to their body wall, uh, to the sclerites and how they're arranged. 
but most of them are bamboo corals and uh, from the bamboo corals mostly Achenella and uh, jay clades Steve for the octa corals what does the octo refer to like where's the ape coming in there yep yeah the the octa corals are really defined by their uh, eight-way symmetry so they have uh, eight tentacles um, surrounding their mouth of each polyp and on top of that those eight tentacles are uh, pinnulated so they have small you know they almost look like hairs or um, branches coming off of the, each of the tentacles so there's no variation from that but the the other group uh, within the anthozoa uh, are the hexacorals, and so they typically have six-way symmetry uh, or multiples of six. Um, so these are the, the stony corals as well as the black corals and anemones. Very nice colonies, though. So we've got current, it, it feels like it's actually coming from the southeast this time. Southeast? Yeah, maybe I'm... You're almost head into it right now. Yeah. By the way, the tether's going. Current from I th this way. You think so? Maybe. Oh. I think it's actually coming so uh, broad across the port. Okay, yeah, that would make sense too, yeah. Okay, so it's but kind of a reversal. Yeah, that's what's weird about that. Maybe it's more dead south. Okay, uh, go for Zoom video. This one looks like a very old J clade bamboo coral, similar to uh, Jason Isis. What it's, makes it very old? Uh, it's got it's got a lot of uh, you know very thick, uh, heavily calcified base. Um, it's got a lot of branches that are you know, kind of uh, coming off in very odd, unusual directions, which indicates that there might be some sort of um, effect of predation that's it's overgrown, or you know some sort of parasite that it's uh, defeated and overgrown again. Higher up in the colony, it's not not so different, but down on the base is where you usually can tell, based on the size, how old they are. It's all approximate. It's not absolute, because uh, for most of these bamboo coral species, you really have to know uh, something about the internal structure of the uh, bamboo coral. So, you know, looking at uh, different layers that the bamboo coral might lay down over its lifespan, kind of like tree rings, but not necessarily in annual or seasonal um, modes, but uh, th those have to be uh, observed after a destructive sampling event. So not something we're really interested in doing to these very old animals unless it's absolutely required by the science. Okay, go wide. For some of the corals that have been sampled in the past when we're looking at age, how old have they gotten? Or do you know like what we have is the oldest on record? Yeah, uh, for bamboo specifically, I think it's somewhere up in the hundreds of years. Um, yeah, there have been a few studies. One I remember from the Gulf of Mexico was on the order of hundreds of years uh, for you know colonies of you know, 10 centimeters diameter base and larger. Um, out here, uh, I'd say it's been more sparse, uh, the age dating studies for corals. I'm looking at this sponge video. Try and get something on that. Yeah. For stony corals, it's actually um, much older, uh, surprisingly. Some Go for Zoom. Enelopsamia colonies from the Line Islands have been dated at over 600 years old. And the colonies aren't that big either. Uh, yeah, that's, that's been dated using radioisotopes. Oh, we've got a couple things here. Nice 
duplectelid sponge in the background. And then there's also some small bamboo coral settlers. Oh, these up in the right. Yeah. But that tells you that there, there's probably some active recruitment going on here. Um, it's not just old colonies. There's uh, reproduction and settlement going on since we have colonies of different sizes. Thanks, video. That's important for you know, reproduction, settlement, and growth is important for healthy populations. Soft coral? Yeah, there's, uh, I've seen a few anthemastis around here. Uh, Go for zoom. Mushroom corals, common name. You'll see why. Sometimes you'll see uh, polyps when they pull in. Uh, they kind of look like a, a button mushroom. A red one, but still a mushroom. Okay, go ahead. But uh, there's there's a lot of uh, interesting diversity with that group, mushroom corals. They were Probably. recently revised uh, <clears throat> in the past. Probably want to start edging back to your 10 years or bit. so into a few different genera. If you keep going that way, you're going to... You're going to be this way, but we're going that way. Yep. And we've also been seeing some um, black corals. Oh. We've also been seeing some unbranched black corals, uh, which could be in the genus Stichopathies or Aphanostichopathies. Uh, and they're starting to appear around this depth, and they'll become more common as we get a bit shallower. Yeah. Very... Interesting Iridogorgia colonies, very large Iridogorgia colonies, the spiral coral, helical coral on these outcrops. I love those ones so much, how they kind of spiral out at you. They're very cool in the Argus view right now, too. This, this area generally would indicate that there's some pretty good flow conditions here, good food supply, good solid substrate for them to grow large and long. There's a number of colonies, of uh, these bamboo coral colonies too, that are deceptive. Uh, oh, is there any way we can zoom on one of these yellow yellow fans that just went by. There's another one up here. Might be new observations for the dive. If if it's a little hairy, it's okay too. We'll see more of them. Are you guys on uh, comms up there? Catching that, Gabby? Yep, sorry. Um, I missed the first bit of that. Say again, Steve? That's okay. I was just trying to point out some, some corals. Uh, we can keep going. Okay. I'm sure we'll see more. We're starting to enter, enter the depth range for some of these yellow fans. So if you see any yellow fans, not the bamboo corals, but smaller, Okay. Uh, we want to take a look at those as well. Sorry about that, science. I'll, I'll listen to you directly. Are you Psy left? I am Psy right. Okay. Yeah. My, oh, no, that's a Paragorgia with a zoanthid. These are just completely yellow bands, possibly plexorids. So I was just keeping my eye out. A bunch of um, these Paragorgia colonies have a some sort of symbiotic relationship with uh, zoanthids, which are uh, more, more anemone-like creatures, but they're in a separate group that tend to overgrow the colony. At oh, we're, we're moving into, I think, what uh, a number of our scientists are sure are interested in looking at, these sparse branching bamboo corals. I'll point them out. Okay. I'm sure we'll see lots more because they tend to dominate the these depths as we get up into the 1900 meters and shallower.
So Steve, we've got some questions coming in about corals since we're seeing so many. Um, so I may kind of sparse them out as we're uh, exploring this area. But do we ever sample these colored corals um, looking for new fluorescent proteins? Oh, um, you know, it, it has been looked at and it, it is uh, of interest to a lot of scientists uh, to see if they're producing interesting just, you know, just, compounds. Just here, right? Just watch that big, uh -oh. big that coral. Like you want to swing back the other way? No, you want to come up or go over? Yeah, fun. watch out for that. Some crazy stuff going on here. <laughs> yeah, it's super tall. Yeah, keep an eye on your bubble, too, when you're going over top of stuff. If it's possible, this thing over in the distance is of interest. Um, yeah, so you know, it's possible. There, there are some studies um, being done on coral fluorescence um, in the deep sea, but generally the, the cameras that we're using don't really have the sensitivity to look at those types of uh, activities corals might be doing. But you know, it is possible, and um, if you find a coral that has that, you can actually uh, imitate that kind of fluorescence, which is really unique by uh, extracting DNA that might code for those types of proteins and producing that uh, in a lab. Steve, is this what you thought it was? Is this yeah, I'm. I'm really curious about this because okay. I don't. I'm not familiar with this at all. It looks okay. Very Sounds bizarre. Good. Take take a closer look. Yeah, totally. I do see that uh, coral off to the starboard there. Yep. And the giant one behind us. Should have some room. That it looks fine. Okay, let's get that zoom. Good. Yeah, this is a very strange primnoid. What makes it strange? Um, it's just it's it's growing up and branching so high on the colony. It's almost like the bottom part's been grazed, and it's been dead for some time. Uh, and uh, and it just started growing again in a typical pronoid fashion. Based on the way that the polyps are moving here, uh, I would say it's could looks like it could be uh, could be candidella. Uh, suggested by Scott, scientist ashore. Okay. Yep. Can we move on? Great. Okay, cool. Thank you. I think a uh, number of the polyps might be closing kind of down axis a little bit, but I didn't really see good evidence uh, of that. So it could be indi indicative of something else, but candidella typically polyps will stick straight out when they're closed. It's quite a steep bridge here. Yeah, on both sides. Mm -hmm. So the, this uh, coral that's on the right-hand side um, just for future notice, if we see one of those very sparse branchers, those are of interest to image. Okay. Uh, just so I don't have to shout it out as we go by, you can just look for those and kind of plan to zoom in on them if you have enough leash. Stage. This one right here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Kind of looking at you know where the the branch point, the bottom branch point, if possible. Can we okay. move one hundred meters, bearing two seven zero. Okay, we can get a zoom. Very old. Old colony. Very heavily calcified at the base. All right. Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, video. Do you know what type of barnacles those are? 
I don't know what type of barnacles those are. Sounds Very like we can cool. look up. This is a disorienting landscape right now. Yeah, it is. Maybe it's the ship rolls too. And like the steep fall offs in various directions. Yeah. They don't seem to be very consistent failing. Yeah, the, the pitches and rolls have gotten a little bit more intense through the day. Is that? Correct or our wind is down. Yeah, we're we're getting kind of like a big swell, like every once in a while, and then it settles down, and you get a big swell. Right. This kind of in the oh, yellow bit this? on the oh, right there. Oh yeah. Can we take a look at that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, zoom. Are we looking at the yellow? Yeah. Uh, probably a stoloniferous octocoral on the bottom there, kind of in the white translucent tissue. But the one I'm really interested in is the yellow fan here. Right. Which could be one of two families. We're going to take a look and see if we can get a better determination of that. Let's say awesome. it's probably more leaning to Acanthagorgia for this one. Uh, which is a um, octocoral that has a very flexible, soft, um, proteinaceous skeleton uh, underneath, kind of supporting the branches. Did you get what you need there, Steve? Yep, that, that looks you. great. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is the first one of the dive uh, for our scientists ashore. They're very eager to take a look at those. Okay quite deep as well. Normally we see them around 1800, but you know, give or take 100 meters. The, the yellow fans. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the yeah we're at uh, about 1900 right now. Structure of the seafloor has gotten pretty interesting. Yeah, it's very dynamic. <laughs> and just like that. <laughs> <laughs> Did we come off the ridge a little? So, yeah, I think if you move towards your right a little bit and get back up here, we'll be more on the crest. We're kind of in between two crests right oh, now. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So right now, there's the, what I just came off of yep. is on my port side. Right, you just came off right here. So if we head back over there. So yeah. the the structure that I just came off of is to port. Okay. So so when I turn to starboard and get back up in front of Argus, I'm going to end up down. Oh, I see. Yeah. And I'm not seeing like another rise over there. So it's possible that the so the contours are just going to go on to the west. Yeah. Okay, well, let's, let's keep it up. We'll, maybe we'll end up back on it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm fine with this. Unless, uh, unless science wants to go back up to the, to the top of the ridge there. I mean, the ridge was pretty nice. Uh, are we far off of it? 
Uh, I think we'll just keep climbing up. I'm sure if we keep going up the hill, we'll find another. Yep. Yeah. Are we still having uh, ship movement problems? Uh, um, much less so. Looking pretty good. Okay. Pretty steady to the west. So Steve, we've got a couple of questions for you about coral reproduction uh, and, you know, how do they reproduce and then, um, you know, find suitable locations for corals. We've definitely seen some areas where it's more suitable habitat, lots of corals versus, you know, areas like this. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we don't know a lot about um, how these particular corals reproduce. We know a lot about how corals reproduce from very few uh, areas of the coral family tree. You know, octocorals I'm referring to specifically, but also very few regions of the world. Uh, we have good reproductive studies for octocorals. But for the most part, we know that uh, the majority of them are uh, broadcast spawners. So uh, the sperm and egg will be released, fertilize in the water column, and then the larvae will settle down somewhere. Uh, nearby or in some distance. Sea star over there. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, you know, the settlement of those corals is really dependent on a number of factors. Uh, like, uh, for example, substrate type might be important. You find uh, corals are typically associated with areas that have a faster current flow because of the way that water flows around uh, topographic points. Oh, there's an umbellopathies also. Can black you go coral. for zoom? <laughs> yep, that one's going to do the tightrope walk and probably eat that branch of bamboo coral there. Okay, that go one looks like hypisteria. Let's see, uh, sea star. Um, but in addition, you know, if you have good flow around a local high area like kind of like this ridge in front of us you know the as the water is flowing across it's delivering food and marine snow particles to these corals that provides them nutrition if you can get um, a, a better nutrition in the area because you have more food particles being delivered per unit time oh can we zoom in on the purple oh the victor is that victor gorgia i think so okay uh go for zoom video be the first one of the dive as well Look at you just bang out the names there, Gabby. Heck wow, yeah. that's impressive. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I just really like this purple one a lot. Yeah. You can zoom in a little more. It's something magical around the 18, 1900 meter uh, depth isobath. You get a lot of these uh, corals that have a bit of a shallower depth, depth distribution, but very nice. Okay, go wide. There's a few species of those around here, so it would be difficult to guess at what species it could be. And then in, in the lower left, there's also, we don't have to zoom on it, but there's a, a, a unbranched bamboo coral, kind of a okay. curly Q whip uh, that we've been seeing for the past few minutes. Oh, here's, a, here's another purple one. Mm -hmm. I have like three coral names. <laughs> <laughs> There's the spirally one, that's already Gorgia. There's the purple one, that's Victor Gorgia. And then there's the bamboo coral, which is most of the other ones. <laughs> Black coral. Oh yeah, Black. That's, yeah. Four, that's four coral names. Bubblegum coral. Aragorgia. There you go. You get a lot of those around Vancouver Island. Aragorgia and Primnoa. Yeah. yeah. They get big. Yeah, huge. This one coming up to the upper left, it looks like a precious coral, maybe. Do half zoom on that. Yeah, go for the half zoom. Uh, actually, it looks like a bubblegum coral, Paragorgia. Sometimes it's tough to tell, but uh, usually you can tell by the both the branches and the associates that are with them. Um, so this Paragorgia has a uh, Usually it has these asteriskema, uh, asteriskema 
Oh, there's a rock pen also. Where? Oh, yeah, like just just six o'clock below the lasers. Yeah, right there. You just had it. Okay. Up and to your left, there's a big ridge of coral. Okay. Oh, let me circle it. There's that rock pen. Okay. Um, I need to. I'm gonna focus on some topography for a second here. Yeah. Sure. You're getting a little under me, I guess. Yeah. Looks like we got some more action coming up. You can yeah. see the. Whole yeah, path I see. And stuff there. Totally. Oh. Steve, what makes a coral precious? Oh, that's a good question. Why, um, are, why aren't they all precious? Well, they can be precious to someone. <laughs> uh, the common name for some of the earliest things that humans used to call corals were precious corals from the Mediterranean Sea. Um, they were called precious because their skeleton makes a material that's very similar to gemstone. Um, and it's kind of like coral red, where you get that color from as well. So that they were often harvested and you know, carved, sold, traded. Uh, so they, that refers to really only one specific family of corals, uh, the coral eids. But the ones in the deep sea, they do produce a similar type of skeleton, but it's not really a commercially viable thing. They're very, very slow growing, mm. fragile, and they're protected. Got some pillows here. We're going over some pillow basalts that cracked open. See the starburst shaped patterns? Funny when those shadows creep in and you're like, oh, this thing's really big. Does this Argus camera have a zoom function? Sure does, yeah. Oh. It's good to know. So we're, it looks like we're kind of in a range where the corals might be fading a bit, uh, kind of sticking to the more in-place hard substrate. Um, there's still a whole bunch of you know rocky material around, but the corals seem to be on the larger, more in-place stuff. Uh, but we're seeing... Yeah, so if I go bearing 255, that should put you where you want to be. Sounds good to me. Okay. Where you've been trending. Yeah, the, I've yeah, you've yeah. been watching me sort of like move two five five and then correct and then yeah, let's do it. You're leading the way. <laughs> I don't even mean to. Bridge, Nav. Fifty meters bearing two five five. That's it. Yeah, science I, I think that that might get us back up to the the rockier part. Yep. Um, it's been taking about two minutes to three minutes for okay the moves to get transferred trickle down to all of to the sea floor. Okay. opportunistic zoom if you have time yeah absolutely go for it go for zoom this one actually might be a another kind of primnoid we've really seldom seen um you can zoom could further. Be, this one could be paracolyptrophora it's a oh hey hello. buddy fish bomb <laughs> It's a type of primnoid that typically occurs in these large lyrate branching fans. 
uh, and it's typically characterized by downward facing polyps, which I'm starting to see good evidence of. They oh, close yeah. the face down axis. Oh, we got a, another brittle star is making some tracks on the back side of that colony. Okay, go ahead. So Steve, we have some students in Nevada who are watching, but have to leave soon because I think their class is ending. Sure. Um, and they're curious about the rocks that we're looking at. Sometimes we see particular patterning, maybe some of the pillows versus nodules. Can you explain a little bit about why that changes? Um, maybe just in general, kind of give us a review of these seamounts that we're looking at. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the seamounts we look at, they're, they're volcanoes. They're quite old, uh, you know, extinct volcanoes. These could be on the order of 60 million years plus. We don't really know. We have some suspicions uh, based on what we know about the geology of the surrounding area and surrounding seamounts, surrounding seafloor. Um, but we don't really know until we sample some of the rocks here. So that's one of our objectives is to, while... Well, we're also looking at the crusty surfaces of the rock. We're looking for evidence of uh, crystals of basalt, which can be used for dating the rocks. Um, so for that, there's a couple different types of rocks we try to look for that help us understand the seamount landscape. They're uh, a combination of these angular ones that typically break off from these pillow basalts 